uh, today, let's do AP Macro 2022. This is set two, question one. Set number two. All right, assume the United States economy is in a short run macro equilibrium at an output level greater than potential output. Again, this is a bit of a game with the College Board. They like to play our output, our current, let's call it our current output. Current output is greater than potential output. Potential output is another way of saying full employment. So we have more output than full employment. We are greater, we're doing much better. So this is what we would call an inflationary scenario. They want us to draw a graph of it, easy enough. So we're just gonna draw a nice little Notice what I'm doing here. Price levels on the vertical, real GDP on the horizontal. I always start with price level, or sorry, long run aggregate supply curve is vertical. Here's my short run aggregate supply curve. And then I'm gonna draw in my aggregate demand. Now anything on this side, when aggregate demand hits that short run aggregate supply curve right there, that shows that we're in an inflationary gap. That point right there, is what we would know of as full employment. Our output is much higher than full employment. Full employment is always right under your long run aggregate supply and it's WF, whereas Y1, or sorry, W, not YF. W1 is where we currently are with our output and it is greater than potential or full employment. Here's our PL1. Here's our Y1. We're definitely Y1 check, PL1 check, YF full employment. We're all done here. Assuming that the government spends 100 billion on your graph, show the short run effect of the change in government spending on the output and price level, label the new equilibrium, yada, yada. So the government is spending. Anytime government spending goes up, I know consumption goes up, that's going to make aggregate demand go up. Aggregate demand is going to shift to the right. Let's call that AD1, AD2. We show the shift. We know our outputs increase. Let's call that Y2. And our price level has to go up when aggregate demand goes up. Let's call that PL2. We want to show some arrows showing that price level going up, showing that output going up, showing aggregate demand shifting to the right. Easy enough. Some teachers don't like arrows inside the graphs. Do what your teacher wants you to do. All right. Uh, looks like we're good with that one. We're good with A. Let's look at C. Assume the marginal propensity to consume is 0.8. Now, anytime I see that, the first thing I think is your MPC plus your MPS, which is your marginal propensity to save. Marginal propensity to consume is 0.8. Marginal propensity to save is 0.2. These two together always equal 1. That's how I know that if this is 0.8, that's got to be 0.2, because these two always equal 1. Easy enough. So... And I do know that I'm looking for a multiplier here. I mean, as soon as they gave me the MPC here, uh, and they say as a result of an increase in government spending, what is the numerical value of the maximum change in each of the following the short run? We know that government spending was $100 billion. Um, so if government spending is $100 billion, my MPC is 0 0.8, my MPS is 0 0.2, Right, so I know to find my multiplier, it's one over the MPS, which is one over 0.2, uh, which gives me five. That is what we call my government spending multiplier, right? So if the government spends 100 billion, I'm simply gonna take that 100 billion, multiply it by five, and know that there would be an increase in real GDP of 500 billion. Easy enough. So real outputs, the same thing as saying real GDP. We could have said real output. That's going to be 500 billion. Easy enough. That's the maximum change. Now, this is different. I've never seen anything like this one before. Uh, so this is something new last year, this year, however you want to say it, um, that we haven't seen before. And the understanding, I think, should be that of every dollar spent, there's a possibility that 0.2 of it would be saved. If our maximum increase in output is 500 billion, uh, well, the maximum of household savings could be 0.2 of that. The 
which would be 100 billion. How else could we do that? I'm not really sure. I think this is fairly clear in a way that understandings that if there was a maximum increase in real GDP of 500 billion, the possible maximum increase in household savings could be 100 billion. Uh, like I said, that's weird enough, and I'd have to do some research to see if there's a different way of thinking about it. Uh, we've never had that kind of question before, but it should make sense that if there's a possibility of real output increasing by 500 billion, that if 0.2 of every dollar spent, of every 500 of that 500 billion, 0.2 could be saved, then 100 billion has to be. 100 billion is the answer, by the way. Uh, I'm just not sure what's the easiest way for them. To explain it and they don't explain it so let's leave it at that we'll move on draw a correctly labeled graph of the money market and show the effect of the change in real output on the equilibrium nominal interest rate so we should know our money market is straight up and down vertical money supply downward sloping demand for money or maybe money demand this is quantity of money on the horizontal now they tell you what's on the vertical nominal interest rates and this is a little strange too what we know is the government they don't tend to do this kind of question very often i don't think i've seen it but a couple times at the most over the last 40 or 20 years of faqs here what we know is the money market we set it up we know that the government is spending anytime the government is spending we know consumption's going up we know that's going to make aggregate demand go up and that's going to make the price level go up and that right there now, notice that the money supply can't change at all. There's been no change to the RRR, and the required reserve ratio. There's been no bonds sold. We haven't talked about the Fed at all. So money supply can't change at all. The quantity of money is fixed. It can only be changed by the Fed. But if the price level goes up, that does affect the demand for money curve. And if price levels go up, people's demand for money the amount of money they want to hold in their pocket goes up. And let's explain that just for a second, because I think it's important to understand one of those sort of triggers or cause effect kind of things with demand for money. If I take you to taco lunch, and taco lunch is 10 bucks, well, I'm cheap, so that's all you're getting for taco lunch. But if it's 10 bucks, what's my demand for money to pay for your taco lunch? Well, it's gotta be $10, right? I've got to have the money in my pocket to pay for your $10 lunch. If next week we go to taco lunch and now it's gone up to $20, well, my demand for money to pay for your taco lunch has to go. I have to have $20 in my pocket to pay for that $20 lunch, right? So if prices are going up, people have to have more money in their pockets to pay for those more expensive goods. That drives up the demand for money. That, in turn, is going to drive up the nominal interest rate. So we'll do NIR1 here, NIR2, no change to money supply. This is all they're looking for right here. Um, easy enough. Based on the change in the nominal interest rate, we know it went up. What will happen to the prices of bonds? You should just know and have it in your brain. You don't have to explain it. I've never seen them ask you to explain this. But we do have to know anytime interest rates go up, bond prices go down. So... We should just know this. If interest rates were have gone down, bond prices would have gone up. And if they did ask us to explain this, we would just say they're inversely related, meaning that they go in opposite directions. And it's not a very satisfying explanation. And when you look at bond prices, there's a couple of videos I've done where I explain it a little more tightly so you kind of understand what's happening in the background. They've accepted this as an explanation in the past, just so you know. This situation, we didn't have to explain it. All right. This is a long FAQ. <clears throat> F here, the United States and the EU are trading partners. The currency in the United States is the dollar. It's the euro. <clears throat> Assume the inflation rate in the United States increases. Okay, so let's write that up because now I know what's going on as soon as I saw that. I've got the U.S. here. I've got the EU here. Here's my big 4X in the sky. 4X stands for the foreign exchange. Price level in the U.S. goes up. That implies the price level in the EU relatively must be lower. But think about that for just a second. Who's going to buy whose goods? If the U.S. has high prices and the EU has lower prices, well, wouldn't it make sense to think anytime we're in this situation that the U.S. is going to be buying more cheaper 
European Union goods. And if that's the case, to buy those goods, to pay for them, the U.S. are going to have to take their dollars and dump them into the Forex. And they're going to have to buy euros to pay for those goods. So understand what's going on here. Now, the graphs here, we're talking about what's happening to the demand for dollars. And on the demand or the dollar side, now let's, again, a foreign exchange graph is just supply and demand. It is what's, it is the amount of currency in the Forex, the supply and the demand for those currencies in the Forex. So when we talk about the dollar, we're talking about what's inside the Forex. So, and that's confusing, right? Because we got loanable funds with the money in the banks in the country. Don't think about that. This is only for an exchange. I don't know why I brought it up. Um, only for an exchange. So we're gonna do both sides of this. Because you can sell, you can show either what's happening to supply or demand. In this situation, usually they let you choose, but in this situation, they ask specifically for demand for dollars. So let's see. First of all, let's label these correctly. If we're talking about what's happening to the dollar, right, we're going to have dollars on the vertical and quantity of dollars on the horizontal. And then that would be euros to dollars. Obviously, I'm still talking about dollars here. I'm just going to show another side. So it's the same thing here. Quantity of dollars. And then it is the euro to the dollar. Kind of sloppy, kind of small board we're working on here, but I think we can make sense of it. Now, if we're dumped, the U.S. citizens to buy those EU goods are dumping their dollars into the Forex because they have to buy, they take their dollars, they put them in the Forex, they buy euros, and then they pay for those European goods. Now, the first thing I think about and where I always go first, and you should always choose one and then just make it work in your brain. If money's going into the Forex, I'm always thinking about the supply of U.S. dollars in the Forex. If money's going in, that supply has to be increasing. Now, this is the one I would have always chose to explain this situation up here, but this time they didn't want, they didn't let me choose. Notice what's happening to the value of the dollar. It's going down. As there's more dollars in the Forex, it drives the value down. Let's call that E1 and the E2. We'll show those arrows with the value going down. Now, they didn't ask me about to do it myself, jerks, right? They asked me about the demand for dollars. Well, if the supply is increasing, this also has to imply that the demand for dollars is going down. Notice how I do this, and you do it however you want, but if the supply is increasing, that's driving the, once I know what's happening to the value, and I do know what's happening to the value because supply increased, I know that that also has to imply that the demand for dollars is going down. If the supply is increasing, it has to be that there's less demand. People aren't taking it out of the Forex. They don't want it as much because there's more supply in there. These are just two sides of the same coin. I know usually what I do is I make sure I understand what's going on. And then I just make my demand curve do what it needs to do if they ask me about demand. The value's going down. We'll call that E1. We'll call that E2. Demand for dollars is decreasing. And the way I would explain this, right, is that as those European goods are cheaper than U.S. goods, uh, U.S. citizens are going to have to put their currency into the Forex. They're going to have to demand a higher foreign currencies. And I think all they accepted for the explanation here was that European goods were cheaper. Um, I would have wanted to explain a little bit more about that and say something like um, that as U.S. goods, I think I would have wanted to say as U.S. goods are more expensive, uh, there's going to be less of those goods purchases purchased. Therefore, the demand to buy our currency, to buy our goods has to go down also. Something like that, if that makes sense. All right, the international value of the dollar, we already answered it twice. We know the value of the dollar is going down due to our goods being more expensive and people not buying our currency anymore. Uh, or we could say due to us dumping our supply of dollars into the Forex, that's going to drive our value down also. They didn't ask for an explanation there. We didn't need to explain it. All right, this is a long one. Um, again here. Here's my dollar, dollar on the vertical, quantity of dollars on the horizontal, 
but it is uh, euro to dollars. Now, suppose the Fed attempts to keep the value of the dollar constant, meaning that they want to get it higher because the value went down. So they want to raise the value back up. They want to get the dollar back to its original value. Should the Federal Reserve buy or sell each of the following? Now, think about this for a second. If we're talking about what's happening inside the Forex, to make that supply of dollars decrease, if I want to, if I want the value of my dollar to increase, I want to buy my dollar out of the forex. This is going to lower the supply of dollars in the forex, and therefore the value has to go up. So they would buy the dollar, right? Because as they, if they're buying dollars, the Fed's buying dollars out of the foreign exchange, there's going to be less dollars. The supply of dollars decreases, driving up the value. At the same time, they would want to sell euros. They would want to dump euros into the Forex. If they dump euros into the Forex, the supply of euros, let's draw it on the supply side or the euro side, the supply of euros would increase because our Fed is dumping billions of dollars of euros into the foreign exchange. This is increasing the supply in the foreign exchange and driving down the value of the euro. So they would buy dollars out to reduce the supply of dollars in the forex, and they would sell euros in the forex to increase the supply of euros in the forex, therefore lowering the value of the euro. Oh, my goodness. That was a long one. All right. Be safe. Take care. Let me know what's going on. If I can help, uh, I'm on WiseAnt. Tutoring there all year long. Let me know if I can help. Be safe. Bye.